Modern. 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 We're prepping for a voyage. Modern. The force of an old fashioned equals whiskey mass times bitters acceleration. Why don't you make that a double? Modern Bar Cart. What's shaking, cocktail fans? Welcome to episode 167 of the Modern Bar Cart Podcast. I'm your host, Modern Bar Cart CEO Eric Koslick. Thanks for joining me for another interview episode where we track down the best and brightest minds in the spirits and cocktail world so that we can share their secrets with you. This time around, I have the privilege of chatting with Melanie Asher, founder of Machu Pisco, a brand that's been bringing delicious Peruvian brandy to the U.S. since 2006. This is one of the first in-person interviews I've been able to conduct in quite a while, and boy, am I glad we could make it happen because Melanie tasted me through six, count them, six different Pisco expressions from the Machu Pisco portfolio. And just like it's not every day that you get to cozy up with six delicious bottles, it's also pretty rare to encounter makers like Melanie with so much passion and expertise across so many different subjects. We'll get into the nitty gritty about Peruvian terroir and grape varietals in just a bit. But first, let's give you a moment to make yourself a drink. This episode's featured cocktail is the Chilcano cocktail. To make it, you'll need two ounces of your favorite Pisco, a quarter to a half ounce of lime juice, depending on how tangy you tend to like things, and four ounces of high quality ginger beer. This is a highball, so you're gonna build this drink in a highball glass with ice by adding first the Pisco, then the lime juice, and then finally the ginger beer. Give it a quick stir with a sustainable metal or bamboo straw, and if you're feeling real fancy, maybe float a few dashes of bitters on top and garnish with a lime wheel. Now, if you're squinting at this drink and saying, hey, that's just a Moscow mule with Pisco, well, you're a little bit right. But according to imbibe.com, the Chilcano cocktail has a history that goes all the way back to the 1800s when Italian immigrants in Peru started enjoying a beverage called the Buongiorno, which was a combination of grappa, lime juice, and ginger ale. Come to find out, either the Italians ran out of grappa or they were simply seduced by the delicious pisco available locally, and we saw a switch in base spirits. The word Chilcano actually refers to a Peruvian soup made with fish heads, and since both the soup and the cocktail were imbibed as hangover cures, I think you can see why the name stuck. Fast forward to the cocktail renaissance and suddenly you see a huge proliferation of high quality ginger beer on the market, and it's not hard to imagine how the drink morphed from its initial grappa and ginger ale formulation to the version you'll find on most cocktail menus today. So, now that you're all lined up with a crushable Pisco cocktail to try when you pick up your next bottle, let's turn our attention back to the interview. In this fascinating conversation and tasting with Melanie Asher of Machu Pisco, some of the topics we discuss include Melanie's journey as an entrepreneur, from hustling flowers in Peru at the age of six to mergers and acquisitions for international spirits companies to founding her own Pisco brand. How Pisco is unique from other unaged fruit brandies from around the world, including which grapes can be used to make it, and what other production considerations are required by the category's geographical denomination of origin. Then we get into the tasting, where we sample Machu Pisco's premium base expression, as well as three different varieties from the La Diablada collection, a custom blend made for the founding farmer's restaurant group, and we wrap up with a pour of Nusta, an ultra premium bottling that only gets produced in the order of about 100 bottles per year. Along the way, we talk about what it takes to run a spirits brand, how Melanie thinks about blending in the unaged spirits space, what to drink with Keanu Reeves, and much, much more. Not only was this a delightful interview, but a great exercise in understanding the diversity of flavor you can encounter within a single spirits category. Indeed, 
from a single producer. It really reinforced for me my dearly held belief that unaged distillates are just as interesting as those that spend years in barrels, if not more so. And I really hope you do get the chance to acquaint yourself with Machu Pisco sometime soon, especially if you've never tasted them. Their flagship expression sells for well under $30 a bottle, and even during a pandemic, that is certainly a price point to get excited about. And now it's my pleasure to present this super engaging conversation with Melanie Asher, founder of Machu Pisco. Melanie, thanks for being on the podcast. Hey, Eric. Thanks for coming over. Yeah. Uh, first in-person podcast we've done in a while. Um, so it's great to be back in person and especially with all these beautiful bottles here in front of us. Um, but before we get into tasting your lovely products, uh, can you just introduce yourself uh, for our listeners and, and tell us how you came into the world of Pisco? Well, I really do think that Pisco runs in my blood. Like it was divine intervention. I was a Pisco baby up brought by the Storks. And uh, this has been a passion of mine. Um, I've always had that entrepreneurial drive and, you know, wanted to bring goodness to the world through Machu Pisco, which is the national spirit of Peru. Mm -hmm. And having grown up there, I figured, why is there no Pisco in America or why is there no Pisco in the world? And it just seemed to me that this would be a way to bring work to Peru and, you know, really expand um, the palate of Americans and uh, Europeans to something completely different that they'd never tried before. Yeah. Pisco is actually a super important spirit for American cocktails going all the way back to the 1800s, of course, with the West Coast and the Pisco Punch in San Francisco. Uh, so you, you grew up in Peru, like roughly how old were you when you were living in Peru? And then how did you come to the United States? So I was born in Peru and lived there until I was seven. And I have to tell you, Eric, that this entrepreneurial bug um, got me at the age of like six. I would go around the neighborhood collecting Coca-Cola bottle caps filling them up with dirt and putting a little flour inside and convincing the neighbors to to buy it, I think more out of pity than anything. But I've just, um, you know, just um, really had that in me since, since early on. I moved to America at the age of seven. And then at the age of nine, I was a grape for Halloween. So at the age of nine, I knew I wanted to get into the Pisco business. So it might be fun to bring that photo here for, for you to look. But um, I put some Pisco in my ice cream. And I told my parents, this is what I want to do with my life. And I think they probably believed I would outgrow it at some point. Mm -hmm. um, but I went on to Duke. And I did my thesis on prohibition in the context of Catholic countries. Wow. Yeah, because normally you hear about it, temperance movements. And I did a comparative study, historical, um, between France and Peru because very um, high drinking populations um, with the Catholic faith as a background. And I looked at how the governments had approached temperance more in... Um, paternalistic form, I wouldn't go so far as say patri um, uh, patri patriarchal, because, you know, they did think that it would help the working class. You had the absinthe um, really taking a lot of uh, mm -hmm. people um, into misery. And, um, and I think that that was more misconstrued, not because of the wormwood, but because of poor distillation practices. Sure. Um, but it was odd and oddly enough that in France, they targeted the working class drink as opposed to cognac or wine, right. correct? Mm -hmm. So temperance was a thing of the times at the turn of the century, early 1900s. And uh, that was a context in France. Um, and in a way, you know, but in some benevolence towards the working classes, but also that um, control of um, the working class was definitely a part of it. Right. And we saw that in Peru because in Peru... Um, we had a temperance movement 
based on Sunday beer drinking. So similarly targeted at the working class where you are not allowed to drink um, on Sundays. So primarily so the workers get to work Monday morning. Mm -hmm. um, but again, you know, um, it was, I'm a history buff, love history. So I'm excited to get into all the, the history behind um, Pisco. But in terms of me personally, I graduated uh, with this thesis in hand, wanted to go run into the liquor companies mm -hmm. to get a job. And my dad said, you're going to be known as a liquor woman. And I said, well, that's what's wrong with that, right? And um, hence, I went um, on to take one year off to really search what I wanted to do. Um, went to investment banking to do business for liquor companies. So mm -hmm. I did mergers and acquisitions, um, IPOs, bond offerings for liquor companies. So, so the, the big time stuff. Yeah. I was not giving up on my dream to be Pisco Queen. So forget liquor lady, what's gonna be Pisco Queen? I like that better, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, um, Melanie, this is this is great. I'm, I'm super excited to talk a little bit about the history of Pisco. And uh, then of course to taste these beautiful expressions. Uh, so before we get into tasting some of these wonderful Piscos that you have here for us, um, I think we should do a little bit of groundwork because I think most Americans would be able to say that they've heard of Pisco or tried a Pisco sour, for example, but I'm not quite sure that they would be able to tell you exactly what it is. And so I was hoping you could just walk us through where Pisco sits in the landscape of world spirits compared to things like vodkas or gins or cane spirits, for example? Well, Eric, Pisco is the oldest brandy of the Americas, and it's got a 400-year legacy mm -hmm. um, before all the cognacs came over. And um, if you see in a lot of uh, cocktail books, um, the old classics have a lot of brandy in them. And... Um, Pisco from Peru was used um, in the 1800s um, in America. So it used to be better known um, before Prohibition. Um, and then unfortunately, um, it got lost in the era and in the trade. But it is a fantastic, delicious spirit made from grapes. Mm -hmm. I mean, how many spirits do you have out there that have about 10 pounds of grapes per bottle? Yeah. That's crazy. And the bottle yeah. doesn't weigh 10 pounds. No, no. And that's because we're basically distilling wine. Mm -hmm. And um, Machu Pisco has 10 pounds of grapes per bottle. La Diablada has 12 pounds of grapes per bottle. And we'll get into that later. But in terms of its provenance, it comes from the valleys of Peru situated in the desert areas south of the equator. Mm -hmm. So tons of sunlight. So we're looking at grapes that gets, you know, 365 days out of the year of sunlight have a super high sugar content and which would make it horrible for wine if you think about it. But for distilling a brandy, it is just sublime mm. and it's one of a kind and it needs to come from Peru because where it is situated um, geographically. Right. And um, these grapes are, you know, have a 400 year tradition before there were um, any sort of pesticides or farming aids or chemicals. And, um, and that's something that, you know, I'm very attuned to because I say if the Spaniards who brought the grapes from um, the Canary Islands to Peru were able to farm all naturally back then and produce such a marvelous spirit. Why can't we do it now? So um, I tend to very much um, follow that traditional line of all natural grapes. Um, and the, the way that I would compare it to other spirits, how I like to, to say it is, um, you go from grapes to wine to pisco, to cognac, mm. okay? In terms of the process, raw material grapes fermented into wine, distilled into pisco, aged into cognac. Similarly, um, for um, the grain spirits, you would have um, grains, the raw material, fermented into beer, mm -hmm. distilled into vodka, 
and then aged into whiskey. Obviously, right. there are nuances there, but I feel like that's a easy mm-hmm. way to uh, to present it. Um, but in terms of uh, raw material, I say we are the king of uh, purity um, because we have a very strict denomination of origin, um, which um, is controlled and limited to um, the Pacific side of um, Peru Mm -hmm. by the ocean. And we are not allowed to add any yeast. We're not allowed to water. All pieces are distilled to proof. So um, if you can imagine that, right? I mean, there's no other Mm -hmm. spear in the world that's distilled to proof. That's a very non-interventionist denomination of origin, if you think about it, because most denominations of origin stipulate sort of, uh, or many, I should say, stipulate a a proof bandwidth or something like that, or they, uh, or they, they, they allow people to do whatever they need to, to the land to cultivate it. But it seems like you're hitting a bunch of uh, process, geography, and sort of terroir aspects with the denomination of origin, which, um, you know, it's, it's interesting to, to see something that does such a good job of protecting purity yeah. in that respect. And if you see all of the spirits here are clear, uh, even our luxury um, presentation, Nusta, um, there is no aging. So no aging is allowed mm-hmm. as well. So in its meant so you can taste the grapes that come from this marvelous, mm-hmm. beautiful, pure region of Peru. What kind of grapes are you allowed to use in Pisco? Is it one single variety or are there are multiple varieties that you're allowed to use? So um, Peru was the vice royalty of the Spanish crown. Um, and that is where um, all the um, merchants came, all the... Um, missionaries landed and all of the king's advisors were running all of um, South America. So if you think about it, all of the immigrants that came to Peru were coming with their grapes. So we have such a vast variety as opposed to neighboring countries that don't have as much indigenous grapes um, for their distilled spirits. So in Peru, we have eight different types of varietals. Um, We've got the um, Quebranta grape, which is very similar to the Mission grape. Okay. Uh, again, the Spaniards bringing over um, that same grape family um, to the Americas. And we've got the Muscatel, we've mm-hmm. got the Torontel. Um, we have the what we call Italia, but it's another version of the Muscatel. And we've got the Moyar, um, which is the Negra Mol in terms of its um, name. And then we have um, the Uvina grape. Um, so all of uh, these grapes are, are this potpourri um, cornucopia of delicious flavors and, uh, and taste that uh, you'll get to see in the concentrated in the spirit format. Right. So for those of you who are following along with some of the constraints that we just spoke about, you know, what do you do if you're a distiller? Well, you look at your constraints and then you look at the places where you do have the freedom to experiment. And, and I must say that for a geographical designation or a, a protected designation of origin product, it's very rare to have eight different types of fruit that you can distill. Now, they're all grapes, but I think we all know, based on tasting a Chardonnay versus a Cabernet Sauvignon, how different grapes can taste. So I imagine in this respect, the kind of variety of grapes that you can possibly use in, in your products is, is a great source of creativity and really where you put your maker's mark on the brandy, correct? Absolutely. You know, and you hit it right there, um, Eric, because it is um, an evolution of wine. As, as wine lovers, we each have predilection to a certain grape and taste profile, mouthfeel, um, tannins, and you feel that in our Piscos. Each one has a different um, aromatic um, nose, um, just different viscosity to it. Um, Some are more citrusy than others. So I would uh, say that if you are tasting um, Piscos that you want to be able to align your thought processes, that it does come from grapes. And uh, and each one is very different from another. Well, Melanie, that's super exciting. I mean, first of all, I'm 
I have one personal bias that I think is is really good for for this interview right now, and that bias is that I'm more interested in uh, unaged distillates than I am in barrel aged distillates. I'm not that you can't do amazing things with barrels. I'm just more interested in the way that something goes from a raw material to a pure distillate. And you know, one of the things that I really want to remind our listeners about is that the best way to think about a distillate is that it is the focusing of a fermentation. When you ferment something, that's where you get all these lovely flavors. And of course, as we just mentioned, these Piscos are native yeast fermented because you can't add any yeasts, correct? Correct. So that is in addition to the grapes that are sitting there in these vines, soaking up decades and decades of the minerals and weather conditions of this landscape, you also have the native yeasts of this landscape that gets fermented and that's where the flavor comes from. The distillation focuses that flavor and really refines it. We were talking about different types of mouthfeels and different types of aromatic profiles just a moment ago. And that is exactly what we're about to get into when we taste these lovely Machu Pisco expressions. So uh, we'll be back after a quick reset to start tasting through this juice. And we are back. We just set up a incredible six spirit flight here. All clear spirits, all Piscos, all from the Machu Pisco portfolio. Uh, Melanie, I'm just gonna let you take it away here. Okay, well, uh, we're, we're up for a ride here, Eric. Um, so this is my brainchild, the Machu Pisco brand. <laughs> And um, the reason I came up with that name was because the first grapes that were brought um, to Peru came from the Canary Islands. Mm -hmm. And this red grape variety um, was first planted in Cusco near where all the gold was and obviously near where Machu Picchu was. So it didn't take hold. It was too cold and the terrain was not adequate. Um, so the Jesuit priests took it down to the desert valleys. Mm -hmm. But in honor of the first grapes where they were planted is the name Machu Pisco. I love it. And um, it's made from the red grape of um, either Negra Criolla and um, the Quebranta grape. So these are two grapes that we have in Peru. Both um, came from the Canary Islands. Um, the Negra Criolla grape... What we call in Peru, the Negra Criolla grape, is what you would call the Listan. I don't know if you've heard of that grape. I, I've heard of it. I don't think I've ever drunk a wine that features it in any major way. Okay. So mostly you're going to find Listans coming from the Canary Islands. And it has just a lot of full body to it, a lot of grittiness to it, mm. olive tasting to it. And that was the first grape that came to Peru. And as an offshoot, a hybrid of that is the Quebranta grape. The Quebranta is the hybrid naturally occurring of the Negra Criolla and the Moyar grape. And that is the grape that you will mostly see in Peru. So Machu Pisco is predominantly Quebranta. We'll on some occasions have some Negra Criolla, but these grapes are characterized as what would be called non-aromatic. Mm -hmm. There's no such thing as a non-aromatic grape, but in terms of tasting, um, we are going to start with um, the Machu Pisco, mm. you know, which has that herbaceous quality to it. It's certainly right? very green on the nose. Very much so. Very much so. And um, what I like to say is that, um, you know, you're going to first get the hints of um, this greenness, which sometimes doesn't parallel to when you're thinking grapiness, mm -hmm. right? But grapes, like uh, wines, you know, they have that scent of the terroir. And, uh, and I do feel like this gives you a lot of the greenness of Machu Picchu. Yeah, and, and it does. I mean, I think the label color is perfect because that's the color green it smells like. And it yeah. also reminds me of pear, which is one of the flavor notes yeah. That I'm that I'm pulling out just from the nose. Very, not not like a not like a super ripe Bartlett pear, but you know, one of those nice green. Yeah, yeah it's got a hint of sweetness on the nose and and you're right, you know, cuz I I I do love grape dissolutes and I love grape vodkas compared to things like corn vodka cuz I think yeah. that corn vodka tastes rancid most of the time. 
Um, but a uh, grape, grape vodka is, I can, you, you can really get that grapiness, that soft sweetness. Um, and this does, it has a very different grapiness to it. You're right. It doesn't, it's not super sweet. It is very green and very lively. Let's taste it. Yeah. Hmm. Oh very goodness. round. So my uh, methodology for distinguishing um, Machu Pisco and La Diablada and Yusta from other Pisco categories, and that's why we started the premium category, is that I do a gravity press. Okay. 100% okay. all our grapes are pressed that way. Um, so therefore, what I find is you get that clean and crispiness, mm. no funkiness. Mm. Uh, I am completely abhorrent of any funkiness in my spirits. And here you can get that roundness. Um, so so this, is your, this is this your first drink of the day, Eric? Uh, of the day? Yes, okay, certainly. Good. Uh, so I would just say with this first one that we just go back to it. Sure. Um, just as your palate gets uh, yeah. used to it. For our friends that are listening, one recommendation that I have for professional tastiness um, to not wear any cologne... Not wear any deodorant, preferably not eat, which can be a little bit dangerous, but we do have our uh, spitting cup right here. That's true, yep. Um, but, and our water. But that, um, that subtleness of this is beautiful for making cocktails. You mentioned the Pisco Sour earlier, you mentioned the Pisco Punch. Sure. And this just has a lot of full-bodied to it. And I don't know if we take go back to it again. If you may, might be able to perceive a little bit in the in the mouth. One of the things that I really like about it is that it does have an incredibly long finish for something that is an unaged distillate. I think a lot of the times what we look for in an aged spirit is that long evolving finish that comes from polyphenols and it comes from the tannins and lignins and vanillins in the oak. But um, but rarely do you come across, and I think if you do come across it, most likely it's a type of brandy or a fruit or a grape brandy where you get that really nice long finish in an unaged expression, which is really nice. Yeah. Um, and you know what makes a big difference? And this is where I was talking to you earlier about going beyond the denomination of origin and, you know, doing good in the world is we only support farmers that are not spraying their grapes. I don't know what's in those chemicals. I'm not a chemist. All I have to say is it was done for 400 years. Why should I go ahead and mess with nature now? Mm -hmm. And I think the fact that I'm distilling a product that has not been touched by sprays, um, there is chemistry in nature that we just haven't comprehended yet. And a different, um, the azotropes of like the chemicals compounding together um, just makes it easier for a clean cut for the heads and the tails. And that you're going to taste throughout all of uh, our Pisco's uh, here today is that clean and crispiness that comes through. Yeah, and I, I have I have tried this base expression of the Machu Pisco before, but it's been, it's been a little while. So this was a great reminder of, um, you know, sort of the, as I, as I said, the, the keystone um, product in your lineup. So, I mean, starting here, uh, it's a pretty pretty aspirational place to start from. So um, why don't you continue to sure. walk us through here and, and show us how the portfolio evolves. So I started with the Machu Pisco because it's made with the most predominant grape, mm -hmm. the most predominant grapes of Peru, which is the Quebranta and the Negra Criolla. And then I'm going to go in to um, La Diablada, which um, I have so much fun experimenting and having fun with La Diablada because it's a natural and in Peru, that is a Pisco blend. And you can ah. have from as little as two grapes to as much as eight grapes. Wow. And um, the La Diablada is named after the dance of life, I like to say. The dance between good and evil, right? Life is a choice. And I think we always know what to do, what's right to do, what's not right to do. Sometimes we ignore it. It's easier to ignore. Then we find ourselves in trouble and have to backtrack and do more work. So um, so on the label, you'll see this is a carnival dance that's danced every um, February in mm -hmm. our Mardi Gras. Right. Of um, the angel and demon. And uh, La Diablada is the name of the dance. So what I wanted to have... Every year with La Diablada is that you get the sweetness of the angel 
but the spiciness of the devil. Ah, I love it. And, um, you know, some folks say facetiously, like, you, like, you never know where the night will take you in terms of good and evil, but... I swear we make this so clean that you will be like in the in the heaven clouds drinking this. This is my fa- this is my baby. This is my favorite. I have to say I have a favorite. This is it, and I could uh, drink this hours on end. Yeah, it's as a producer, you w- would like to say that you don't have favorites, yeah. uh, but you inevitably do have them. Um, and the one- history of this is <clears throat> um, that I created this with my grandmother. Oh, no kidding. Yeah. Um, So I would line up, like you, like about 10 to 12 samples of blends. And um, when I started the business 14 years ago, women were not drinking Pisco in Peru. It was a rough man's drink. And if Ah. it didn't scratch your throat, it wasn't Pisco. So when I started distilling and making a distillate at 40%, people were shocked. I was like, this green guy is making water. And um, with my grandmother, we came upon this blend. And do you get those like subtle rose petals Uh in the nose? I was going to say it's super floral and uh, it's got like a little bit of honeydew melon in there. It's it's, it's very, uh, it's very, very soft on the nose. It's, it almost reminds you of a perfume in a weird Mm -hmm. way, in the the way that the Machu Pisco, um, reminded me of fruit, like fresh, ripe fruit. This reminds me more of floral and sort of like a, a fragrance that I would smell if somebody walked by me. Yeah. Uh, I I tell you, um, it's so inviting in the nose. And oh. and you were talking about legs earlier on the Machu Pisco. Yeah. This has, just stays with you. It yeah. has just like, we can be, you take one sip and you'll still be feeling the after taste um of those rose petals and um and it's got a lot of viscosity to it it's very round yeah and so i'm blending here the quebranta which is why one trans as we're doing the tasting we're going from the quebranta and the machu pisco to the acholado and la diablada which has the quebranta as the base minimum 50 percent and then it has the italia and the muscatel which we're going to taste next um mm. So it is a base of the Quebranta, and sometimes I play and I um, add some Torrentel in there. But even though it's a vintage Pisco, because every time that the harvest is different, the end product needs to be the same. So what's behind the curtains is maybe a different blend, but you will always get this delicate floral notes. Right, and that is the art of the blender. And most people think of blenders in the context solely of rickhouses or... Uh, in in brandy terms, the paradi, you know, the people who yeah. are going, you know, into and comparing these brandies uh, expressions from years and years earlier, and then trying to blend up to that flavor profile to perfect it. But again, that's usually based on the manipulation of wood and occasionally with things like dosage. Uh, but here, the art of the blend is, I would argue, much subtler in that you ha- you're basically playing the cards that Mother Nature has dealt you in a given year and then trying to come up with the same hand every time. And that's very tricky. Yeah. Uh, and so, uh, you know, I think some people might be alarmed. It's like, oh, oh, my favorite expression is changing year over year. Well, the blend is changing, but the flavor is remaining constant. Exactly. And I, I think that's something that's lost on some people. Yeah. And uh, I, I think if there's one takeaway from this particular expression that I, I'd like to emphasize is that, yeah, you know, it's it's – it's okay that things change on the back ends without your knowledge, because if it's being done right, it's being done in your best interest so that you do have that consistency year after year. Exactly. And what, what uh, more discouraging than you go to your favorite brand and it doesn't taste the same as the, and sometimes it's fun that, but uh, when you, you find that sweet spot and I would say that, you know, there are a couple of types of blending, right? There's blending with your leftover, with inventory at the end of the year and you just blend it Mm -hmm. as opposed to like artfully defining what this brand stands for. And uh, you always get those delicate um, notes um, that Abuelita and I uh, started distilling and uh, tasting with her in her bathrobe and uh, pearls for breakfast. Abuelita. I wish she was here. Mm. My goodness. Well, we're going to get to her soon. Okay, good. Yeah. Well, let's keep going here. Okay. So... Next here, Eric, is the La Diablada Italia. So we have 
on the La Diablada bottle a ribbon representing the eight grapes of Pisco. And then we will um, cordon off each grape varietal separately within the La Diablada family. Wow. Okay, so um, this is 100% of what we call in Peru the Italia grape. It's a white grape, and it is the Muscatel of Alexandria. So um, I probably have some in my refrigerator. You can get it in, in America, um, but a widely known Muscatel grape variety. And uh, this is over-the-top citrus. So when right. you were talking about La Diablada being a perfume, let me tell you, when you're drinking this, you can dab some on and really talk about perfume. It is... Right? Yeah. Super, super, super citrusy. But also very grapey on the... This is probably the most conventionally grapey nose that I've come across so far. Right. And this is only the third right. one we've tasted, but... but um, and then uh, Muscatel de Alexandria, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe it is one of uh, a couple varietals that is also used in another high-altitude brandy called Singani. Yes, exactly. Correct. So as I was telling you earlier, Peru was the head of the vice royalty. So then when the pioneers went to the other countries um, and they went to Bolivia, they took grapes with them. And then um, this is the one that they um, cherish and use for the Singani. Mm -hmm. The Italians brought it to Peru. So different than the mm -hmm. others. I usually only put like 10% because it's so overpowering. Mm. It is just so... La Diablada blend, Naturalado, has about 10% of the Italia. Wow. Otherwise, it just takes over the blend. And, um, and this is um, an interesting thing for you. The Italia grape um, was exported from Pisco, Peru, from the port of Pisco, Peru, where it comes from, to San Francisco during the gold rush. And it is this variety that you're tasting right now that made it across the seas to the bank exchange, the barber, the Pisco punch was invented. And where um, you had it mixed um, by the bartender called Duncan Nichols, uh, proprietor of the bank exchange, mixing Italia, Pisco, pineapple from Hawaii, gum syrup, lemon and cocaine so of course those were the recipes um back in the 1850s when all everything was legal and um, we had a massive massive trade of italia pisco to the united states because this cocktail cost 25p in comparison to other cocktails that cost 10p and um it was the first bar that allowed women into it in california and you had to um, take a lap or walk around the bar after having two because it was in such high demand and it was potent. So if you could come back to the bar after walking around the block and there was a seat available, you could have another. So this is a great story behind the Italia. Yeah, that's fantastic. Uh, I think, yeah, the key there was definitely if there's still a seat available. Um, I think, I think, well... We don't have people going to bars uh, these days, but once we can go back to bars, that's a really smart kind of like easy way. Uh, it reminds me almost of the, I think the Trader Vic's zombie or something like that, where it's like, yeah, you're only getting two of these. Yeah. Uh, otherwise, you're not getting home. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> no, and uh, and stylistically, um, this one has a little bit um, more funk because I do put some lees in the distillation. Mm. So just to add a little bit more of an inf to it, mm -hmm. and uh, and you might get that in the mouthfeel. Slightly stemmy, yeah. It's but but not in um, you know. Occasionally we'll get a batch of lavender for our lavender bitters that's just uh, has a lot of leaves in it, and and that produces like a really sort of off stemmy flavor. But this is just sort of in in the background, and yeah. because the Muscatel de Alexandria grape is so rich, um, it, I think it really does add a, a nice little note there in the background. Yeah. So this is fun for doing your Pisco Punch. Totally. Um, for the La Diablada blend, and now we're going to taste the Abuelita Centennial Special Blend. So this is her. Let me introduce her. Amelia, what's her name? She lived to be 102 years old. Abuelita, looking Abuelita, good. Abuelita, yeah. She was 97 in this picture. Oh, 
If <laughs> everyone wants to look at the um her there, this has eight grapes in it. Let's see if we can get a focus on Abuelita here. There she is. All right. I'll snap a picture so, and put it on the show notes page. This guy's has eight grapes and uh, an ode to her after she passed away, and it is just a flower bomb. Yeah, it reminds me of prickly pear. Yeah. I would say lychee. Uh huh. Sure. Yep. But I get, get prickly pear. Yeah, yours as well. lychee is certainly better. I don't know there. if they're. I don't know if they're in the same family. They might be actually. Maybe. Yeah. Total lychee. Yeah. And this is in our acholado blend. That tastes like candy. Yeah. Phenomenal. Wait, if I were to taste this blind, I'd be like, "This is well." I, I wouldn't actually think this, but it, it reminds me a little bit of like the watermelon Jolly Rancher. Have you ever smelled yes, that smell? Yes, It's yes, very distinct. Yes, very much so. And there's a reason, I think, why the watermelon Jolly Rancher is everyone's favorite Jolly Rancher is because whatever flavor compound they use must be the closest to natural. Yeah. Because this is... Yeah. I, I hadn't thought about that, but, you know, um, from the... Very subtle acholado to this one because they're both blends. Mm. From three grapes to eight grapes. Wow. I recommend a martini style cocktail. Uh huh. A champagne cocktail. Yeah. Right? Um, anything mixed with uh, vermouth, just doing grape on grape, putting some sherry in there. I was going to say this would be great in like a bamboo or an Adonis or something like that. One of those uh, sherry kind of martini um, equal equalizer riffs. Yeah. Yeah, I mean that's uh, that's what I love playing um, with. Um, the the beauty about pisco is that you have that grape uh, that grapiness uh, to it, and this just blows it. In terms of you can't get I think any more flavorful with this with eight of varietals. No, I mean, Abuelita just crushed it with this. Um, thank you, that, thank you. That is probably the most exciting thing I've tasted since I tasted Baltimore Spirits um, Pechuga style smoked apple brandy. Wow. Which is one of my favorite things that I've ever tasted. This is this is right up there with that. Oh, it's thank really you. good. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. So sipping it on its own is uh is the way to go. Exactly. Oh yes, yes. That's man. Oh overload almost. It's almost like a sensory overload. Yeah. No, uh, it is. And it just uh and it just stays with you. Right? It just uh, stays. But I would say she drank a shot of Pisco every night before she went to bed. And uh, she ate her vegetables, her broccoli, and her green beans, but also drank her uh, pisco at night. Just like the queen. Yeah. yeah. Hey, there we go. The Still queen. going. I think the queen has like three drinks a day. <laughs> so um, the last one we have here is the Farm Pisco, which um, I created in collaboration with our friends at Founding Farmers in D.C. This is... An inversal of um, our typical La Diablada. They have, they're very heavy on the Italia. Remember I told you I keep in my blend 10% Italia? Mm -hmm. John Arroyo, their mixologist, came down to Peru, visited us. And this is a blend that we've worked together for the restaurant group. In terms of supporting fair farming practices, because a lot of times, Eric, the farmers don't get paid, the brokers do. Mm -hmm. And the farmers don't get paid for six months after the grapes are harvested, which is a travesty. Right. So we're very much into fair wage, living wages, and paying the farmers directly. And um, and that's what farmers, Farm Peace goes all about. That's, um, it's much more of, a, I would say, um, a f more funk-based. And I think there's a whole movement um, in the cocktail world in terms of mezcals or Jamaican rums. Mm -hmm. And exactly. I think that this is where John was going with this in terms of uh, his blending style. Yeah, it's um, it's a little bit breadier on the nose yeah. than anything. You know, I, everything was either fl fruit or flowers yeah. up to this point. When I when I nosed this, you certainly got some of the more yeasty, dessert, yeasty yeah, yeah, yeasty, desserty, bready, yeasty, uh, almost like maybe some flan flan notes. Um, yeah, yeah, a little custardy on the nose, uh, but still. Distinct uh, on the palate, you go you go right back to that uh, uh, Italica, you know, yeah. sort of robust um, 
really grapey. It's it's lovely. It's it's again so different than the four things that we've just tasted. And they use this for their um, El Capitan, which is based on um, the original recipe, the Manhattan, mm-hmm. um, which um, we called it the Capitan in Peru, and it's equal portions red vermouth and uh, pisco, and uh, that's what they're doing at uh, Founding Farmers with it. Great, yeah. Um, well, for those of you in the DMV area, well, maybe we can't go to Founding Farmers just yet, but you might be able to look up their uh, their program and see if they're able to do anything to go if you're near one of their locations, and I know they have several. Yeah. And then finally, let's get into our crown jewel, the Nusta. There are only 100 bottles produced Whenever it fancies me. It's uh, not every year. Ooh. It's when it's just right. So these bottles are made by hand in the tradition of Wacos. So Peruvian royalty during the Incan age would go to their graves with uh, vessels of alcohol, of chicha, of corn maize, fermented for them to travel with pleasure into the afterworld. Right. So Nusta means princess. So the story behind this, I just have to tell you, it's just gorgeous. The Incan king would, was a conqueror. So when he came to the Ica region of Peru, he met this beautiful woman of royalty, but of the area. And he came to conquer that land. Mm-hmm. And she said, I'm already engaged. You know, I can't go back to Cusco with you and be one of your many wives. So he said, what is it going to take? And she said, bring water to my people. Because we're in the desert. We make our Pisco in the desert valley of Ica. So he created a canal all the way from Cusco, all the way down to Ica. And she ended up staying with her fiancé. Never went to Cusco, but she got the... She got what she needed, smart lady. She got what she needed. So cheers to that. Cheers. And this is... A sip of one of the last bottles of Musta. Oh my goodness. So a hundred made when you feel like it. Yeah. Goodness. What what would one pay for such a thing? Three hundred well, we sell it um to at about a hundred and twenty five dollars a bottle and it usually retails about three fifty. That's about right after yeah. the distribution and retail markups, right. yeah. Yeah. Um, and, but uh, for something that's a hundred bottles made quasi annually that's really not that unreasonable compared to you know uh look at some of these brandies that retail for for that sort of thing and they're 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 cranking out you know at least a thousand bottles well i have to tell you that's part of my philosophy and um capitalism gets a bad rap and i think true capitalism is about having respect for the supply side and mm-hmm. for the demand side it's not about exploiting um, the farmers and asking them for a discount. I don't do that. I pay my workers twice the market wage and uh, I don't get away with, okay, it's the market wage, that's what I'm going to pay you because I have them hand select each and every single one of the grapes and that's laborious for them to be cutting away all the raisins and uh, and all any botrytis that might be on the vines because they are naturally grown. Um, so when a distributor comes to me, Eric, and asks for a discount, I mean, it just tells me a lot of the mindset. And that's okay that they do. If they were to ask me, what are your numbers? What are you um, earning per bottle? Because I feel like we need to be transparent in this business. And gone are the days that you can essentially just um, have a brand um, sell for you. If you're a distributor, it's a partnership because you believe in the producer. Mm-hmm. And um, all of our brands, starting at the premium level, are based on fair pricing. So we do fair wage to our workers and to the farmers, but we are also fair pricing to the consumer. Sure. So Machu Pisco, even though it has 10 pounds of grapes per bottle, retails at about $24 a bottle. And that's about, it's that's ba- a steal. It's bananas, yeah. It's bananas. Uh, and and for people who who don't necessarily think about this too much for a brandy. That's a huge deal for a grain based distillate. Not so big a deal for a fruit based distillate. Huge deal. I attended an apple brandy seminar at tales of the cocktail um, two years ago. And 
the numbers that came out of the apple brandy world, and I'm sure that there are some similarities between apples and grapes in terms of the the yield that they yeah, produce per pound. Um, astronomical how much it costs them to put their stuff on the market, and they put it on the market at a similar price as grain-based distillates. So it shows you, like, that's another one of the reasons why I'm so fond of brandies, because they are so high quality relative to the price. Really, you know, if they acted like other types of ba uh, distillate bases, on the market, you could be charging much, yeah, much higher prices definitely. for these things. And, and we're all about, for all our lineup, we're about extraordinary quality at amazing value. So even though we aren't in the value category, I want to offer that because my dream as a childhood girl dressed in a grape at nine years old for Halloween was to have a bottle of matcha piece go on every bar around the world. And well, you're getting there, certainly. What do you think about this? I, new stuff? It, uh, orange Blossom. Yeah. Just incredible. Right. Like smells like Turkish delight. Mm. It it has a it has this uh, s sort of an intangible quality to it on the nose that just kind of makes you want to sit and smell it for a little while. Do you get some um, butterscotch in the yeah. mouth? Yeah, Not that's either. why I was kind of feeling, uh, you know, kind of going into that like desserty Turkish yeah. delight kind of totally, area. Totally, completely. Oh wow. Yeah, it is certainly confectionery, but it's still so grapey. You know, it it, it it has certainly a luxurious feel to it. And not to say that some of these other expressions don't, you know, looking at you, Abuelita. Um, but uh, it's, yeah, it's it's really, really beautiful. And I think certainly, um, certainly an accomplishment for the amount that is produced. Well, thank you. I mean, that, uh, that, that I'd recommend to go in a cocktail. Of course. But hey, there's always uh, the Nomad in New York that has their reserve uh, line uh, and, you know, playing around uh, with the new stuff. If that's up your alley, you can, uh, of course, make a sidecar with it. Yeah, I imagine you could. And, you know, if, if, if somebody is allowed to make a cocktail with something that you're not supposed to make a cocktail with, uh, they will. Yeah. And I appreciate that as well. Uh, well, Melanie, thank you so much for tasting us through these amazing expressions. Um We'll have details on all these over on the show notes page at modernbarcart.com forward slash podcast. And we're going to come back for a little lightning round after a quick reset. Stay tuned. And we're back. Uh, we, uh, we had to take a little water break after that uh, six expression tasting of the Machu Pisco lineup. Um, so now we're back. We're hydrated. We're ready for some lightning round questions. So starting off here. Melanie, what is your favorite cocktail? And if you don't have a favorite of all time, what's something you've been more recently obsessed with? Okay, summertime cocktail was grapefruit juice, honey, ginger freshly pressed. Ooh. I've got a mad juicer, so I squeeze, I press my own ginger, and La Diablada Pisco. Oh my goodness, like, that's a morning starter. So to walk me through that again, so we've got the we, base spirit is the Pisco, and then you've got fresh grapefruit, honey, and ginger juice. Yes. And like you said, very important to have the fresh grapefruit. Just squeeze half a grapefruit in there. So delicious. Mm. Oh, I could have that nonstop. I am an avid juicer, I have to say. So when I'm making my morning juices, I always concoct what I could add a little Pisco with for the afternoon happy hour. Another one is um, pineapple and red peppers. Mm -hmm. Delicious. Ooh, and red peppers. And yeah. so you get that almost like an orangey color to the juice. Mm -hmm. That sounds amazing. Um, red peppers is not an ingredient that you'll see behind many professional bars, let alone home bars. You know, I was thinking that. I think some more, more bars do have like fresh press juicers, right? You've got these like high-end bars around the world, mixology. And if you can have freshly pressed fruit... That's like nature's gift to us. And especially if it's a restaurant, I don't think that the chef is going to complain if he can all of a sudden make this amazing romesco sauce. Exactly. Right. Make the sauce, save some juice, and then the bartender gets to use some. You get a little symbiosis between the front and the back. Um, that's a great idea. All right. Next question. If you were a cocktail ingredient, what would you be and why? Is that not obvious? Pisco, baby. <laughs> Machu Pisco. I mean, I tell you. I um, I grew up with people telling me you never get a hangover with Pisco. 
And I was a little bit incredulous because I went through that college phase that we all do. And um, and I have to say, like, all the highs without the lows, brother. Like, no hype. You're going to do the Machu Pisco Challenge. You've got my contact information for your viewers if they have any complaints. But I tell you, like, bringing joy to the world, uh, no hangover, and uh, no llama drama. No llama drama. And uh, is that a hashtag? Yeah, it is. Yeah. Uh, so for, for you, uh, you, I saw something on the website, uh, being a, a Pisco girl. That is my Pisco sister. Woman. So actually, yeah. So this company was started um, with my sister, Lizzie. And um, she graduated from Harvard Law and decided she wanted to be an actress in Hollywood. And then so um, she got her um, actor's guild card in New York. And then we're like, hey, why don't you be our Pisco girl? So she went up into space with Buzz Aldrin uh, carrying a bottle of Machu Pisco and did one of these um, gravity flights. And uh, she is uh, the face of her Pisco and uh, a great partner uh, to have. That's incredible. So, uh, yeah, make the, the hashtag if it, to use if, if you're enjoying a nice bottle of Machu Pisco is hashtag no llama drama. Really good hashtag. Um, next question. If you could have a cocktail with anyone in the world, past or present, who would it be? Where would you go? What would you drink with them? Just kind of paint us a picture. Okay. So I am a big fan of Keanu Reeves from seen Constantine. Obviously the Matrix, all-time favorite, but Constantine blew my mind. Um, and I was at uh, Tales of the Cocktail in New Orleans, and uh, it's a five-day drinks festival, so signed up for the gym. And he actually was um, working out there at that gym um, while filming Bill and Ted's adventure. But I actually never got to meet him. So um, we never crossed paths at the gym, but I did send, uh, because I know he is a big wine lover, um, I did send a case of miniatures to the set for all the actors. So I hope one day I can have a cocktail with him and, uh, and his partner, Alex Winters, who is Bill um, in the movie, said, I'm sure he enjoyed it. And, um, and that would be a fun, uh, that would be a fun Transitional thing as we were talking. My idea, Eric, is to transition wine lovers into Pisco lovers. I just feel like it's just a natural transition, you mm -hmm. know? Um, so, yeah, there you have it. Yeah, I love that. Enthusiasm is a verb, right? It's, it's, an, it's an abstract noun if you look at it in the dictionary. But really, what it's describing is, is a verb, a set of energies, and I think that it's such a logical progression to take somebody who's into ferments and transition them into distillates. Because if you see them have that sort of energy and enthusiasm behind the way that they talk about wine or even beer, uh, give them something that was distilled. Give them something that takes that energy and focuses it to like a laser beam prismatic focus. Uh, and I, I mean, I think it's so natural. I'm so glad that that's your, that's your goal because, uh, I think it's, it's also a goal of mine through the podcast. So, um, it's really exciting to hear. Well, I am very excited to get to, um, try and do a lot of mixing with the modern uh, bar cart. Uh, so hopefully we'll, uh, we'll have some fun playing around, uh, afterwards. Mm -hmm. Got some shrubs and some bitters here. So, um, yeah, that's excellent. Next question, um, what is a cocktail ingredient that you've never tasted and why? Okay, I'm not butt kissing here, but it is the sassafras bitters <laughs> that your company makes, Eric. Yeah. <laughs> so a little plug, um, I went I, onto I your website. And of course, I didn't bring that. them today like a, like a jerk. No worries, but um, I'm really into like the health, nutritional um, part of life, hence all natural grapes non-intervention um, fermentation. And somewhere along the round, one of these blogs, I saw that sassafras is like one of the healthiest ingredients for virility. Mm. Um, wow. Yeah. Hello there. So uh, <laughs> so I'm going to be going into the Modern Bar Cart uh, website and getting some. Um, thank you for the other bitters that you brought, but that yeah. just really intrigues me. Awesome. Well, we're excited to, to see what you think of it for sure. Now, last question here in the lightning round. Um, do you have any controversial or sort of against the grain opinions or stances in the spirits and cocktail space? I would say that 
Machu Pisco is the purest spirit out there, hands down, like bar none. And I've met with other distillers um, throughout the world. I travel, I meet um, um, colleagues of mine. And uh, particularly in Europe, I just love getting into these like um, friendly fights over the dinner table in terms of how is it that we distill to prove, and they can't. And they question um, what will be the taste profile that is, as I'm going into the tales, that I will pick up those congeners mm -hmm. and hence make a spirit that chemically is not very pure because we are distilling to prove. And I go back, my counter argument is like, well, what does your water have that you're adding? Like, there's so much bad water out there, mm -hmm. right? So, like, what levels of purity are you getting of water that you're adding? God forbid, obviously, we've got um, reverse osmosis. But, you know, at what level of, like, filters or nano are using nano filters? So, um, so we are the only spirit that uses organic, all-natural raw material that adds no interventionist, um, no added yeast, only wild yeast. No enzymes are added to it, no sugar, no coloring, no flavoring. Um, so it's as clean as you can get for, for a spirit, and the proof is in the pudding. Mm -hmm. Yeah, purity is an interesting topic to discuss because a lot of people think of it as an absence, an absence of bad stuff. Um, but, you know, with that, you sort of also have to compare of like, well, what, but what is there? You yeah. can't really, you, if you talk about purity as an absence, you're talking around it. Yeah. Uh, and I would much rather be talking about actually what, what is in there. Yeah, and that's a great point, Eric, because if I wanted to be, um, to go through like, hey, we have five times distill. Okay, so you're like triple distilling a vodka. You're only getting ethanol, right? That's just pure ethanol. But then why are you putting glycerin in there, right? Mm -hmm. You go through all this trouble to make your pre your product. And whereas where we do a continuous, a discontinuous distillation, so cutting out the heads and cutting out the tails, but I do it by taste. Mm -hmm. So I do it very mindful, slow distillation. Um, and for me, it's just like intuitive distilling when I'm tasting, okay, the methanol is present throughout the entire distillation. Some people think it's only the heads. That's wrong. So you are like measuring like what parts of the esters do you want in there, right? And what is it um, like some of um, the methanol will give you a little bit of that fruitiness. Um, so it is an art. And, um, and like you said, it's interesting to see what is in there. And there's some things we just don't understand sometimes about nature and the chemistry of it. Um, like, for example, your vitamin C, right? It can be made into a vitamin and you're isolating, but as opposed to eating an orange and we don't know other compounds that are magically giving good um, feelings to our body. Yeah. And the same thing about like our Piscos, you know, I say they don't give you a hangover and I can't tell you why because we're not chemically 100% ethanol, right? But we've got some of those like magical components that uh, we can to a certain um way fine through chromatography but you know at to what level so uh, sure. that's the magical part of it there's a lot of work to be done in the spirit space which is why it's so exciting is we're, we're nowhere near uh approaching some sort of limit to our understanding of, of how these things work um so as as science continues to improve and as as methods and and ingredients continue to improve I, I'm, I'm sure that we'll make little tiny steps in that direction, but we still have such a far way to go to understand the actual chemical processes at work behind our spirits. But the one thing that you said that I think is a perfect way to wrap up this interview uh, is the point that you made about slow distillation. And this is something that we see time and time again, the best spirits that come across our tables that, that, that are on our bars or in our liquor cabinets tend to be the ones where people are taking their time with the distillation. Uh, it's something that a number of past guests, one that jumps to mind immediately is R.B. Wolfensberger of, uh, of Lone Wolf. They, they make a single malt vodka. They also make a, um, a really cool aged gin and just a, amazing stuff. But they achieve this really creamy mouthfeel through super, super slow distillation and, and unforced filtration. And, uh, and R.B., the distiller, the one thing that he emphasizes over everything else is just, I take my time yeah. and it shows. So, um, Melanie, thank you so much for explaining 
some of the history and terroir of Pisco. Thank you for tasting us through these amazing expressions, uh, all of which were stunningly different. Uh, and I would highly encourage people who have access uh, to these spirits to actually go out of your way to do a comparative tasting. If you really want to blow some people away, you don't have to do all six like we did in this interview, but you could simply take three of the most different ones, uh, put them side by side, maybe the base expression, maybe one of the muscatels and maybe uh, abuelita, mm -hmm. sit them side by side and take your friends who might be clear spirit skeptics, right? Maybe you got a bunch of bourbon nerds in your, in your uh, cadre, taste them through three ridiculously different and seductively high quality and just sensory explosion kind of situations of spirits. And uh, I bet you're going to have some, uh, some Pisco converts on your hands. Uh, so can you just take us through the best way to digitally connect with you and your brand and uh, the best way to find, of course, these bottles so that we can get them on our home bars, especially now that most of our cocktailing and uh, sipping is being done in the home? Of course. Um, every bottle um, has our website, uh, www.machapisco.com. Um, Hashtag no llama drama. No llama drama. We are on Instagram at machu underscore pisco. Um, Twitter at Machu Pisco with a double C and um, you know our email um, from our website goes directly to me I answer every single one of them um, any query you have um, I'm always open and uh, and you know happy to to walk you through that uh, tasting or uh, or experience uh, that we love to share with the world yes and always always super gracious um, it's been great connecting with you here and um, in terms of availability, uh, are there certain markets where these spirits are most available? Um, are you nationally distributed? What's the situation? So we are um, up and down the East Coast and up and down the West Coast um, in Texas, Illinois, Oklahoma, Missouri, Kansas, um, Indiana, um, Minnesota. Um, so most major U.S. markets. Louisiana, yes. Um, and help us out, guys. Uh, if you can go to your local liquor store in certain markets where we're not yet, like Michigan um, or Colorado um, or South Carolina, um, just uh, ask them for your, you want your Machu Pisco fix. So thanks for that, uh, letting me get my shout out there. Oh, of course, of course. Well, you can't have a bottle on every bar in the world if you're not distributed in all major markets yet. Uh, but yeah, awesome that you are so widely available here in the U.S. Um, compared to a lot of folks that and we have. And one last thing, we, you can get it online from uh, wine.com. Um, and most, most all total wines do sell it. Right, right. And wine.com um, certainly is emerging in the age of COVID as a super important resource for people who want to get things shipped to their doorsteps in states that do permit that. So uh, might not be your state, but certainly if you're looking into that option, um, you know, worth, worth, a, worth a check to see if, if you can skip the trip to the store, stay safe, and uh, of course, enjoy great peace go. So Melanie, once again, thank you so much for being on the podcast. Thank you, Eric. Hey everybody, thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, there's two big things you can do for us here at Modern Bar Cart. One would be to tell your friends and family if you think they'd enjoy listening to us talk about cocktails. And if they don't download podcasts, they can always stream our episodes on their desktop directly from the show notes page at modernbarcart.com. The other thing you can do to help would be to head on over to iTunes or wherever you download your podcasts and leave us a review. Five stars are great, but we're more interested in your feedback. And the beauty is, the more reviews we have, the easier it will be for other folks out there to learn about our show. We're trying to start a cocktail revolution here, and by spreading the word, you're helping us fight the good fight. You can always reach us by emailing podcast at modernbarcart.com if you're looking for cocktail or bartending advice, or if you're a pro who would like to pull up a mic and be interviewed for all to hear. Also, definitely follow us on Instagram and Facebook at Modern Bar Cart for cocktail porn, recipes, and entertaining tips. And... 
keep an eye out for new product releases and special offers, which are happening all the time. We love our listeners and we really enjoy giving you exclusive discounts and sneak peeks at our latest and greatest cocktail projects. This episode may be over, but for you, the mixological fun and adventures are just beginning. So remember folks, drink responsibly and experiment boldly. This episode was made possible with editing and production assistance by Samantha Reed, Delicious Pisco, courtesy of Melanie Asher and Machu Pisco, and a little bit of interview magic by yours truly. This has been a Modern Bar Cart production, copyright 2020.